Oh my goodness, this is dark. Okay, that's better. Now I look like a ghost. It doesn't matter. Um, hey guys, so most of you know my name is Melissa. And for those who don't know, my name is Melissa. <laughs> um, I'm uploading this video because I wanted to share my testimony with you guys. For some of you who already know me, you might know some of it, but I don't think there's anybody besides my husband that knows my full, complete testimony. And my cousin Nehemiah, she knows. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what brought me to Christ and why some of you uh, were able to witness this drastic change, what that means. And um, I'm just going to start at the beginning. So I lived in Georgia for a year. Um, I was going through a really tough time with my mom and it moved me to Georgia. At that point, I was just willing to just try anything because things were getting really crazy with my mom. Um, and so I moved to Georgia to move in with one of my cousins. And when I was in Georgia, I was dating women. Um, I had been dating women for a long time. My, my first kiss was a girl um, from six years old. So I had a long... Um, I had just a long time just dating women and for some time in my life I was dating only women um, but I was I guess what you can consider a bisexual but I, I spent a few years as a lesbian anyway when I moved to Georgia um, I was dating only women and uh, when I got to Georgia I started to um, be interested in this one guy and so I was dating both women and men when I lived in Georgia. And I remember there was a situation that occurred where um, my heart was completely broken. Um, I had high expectations for something that I shouldn't have had high expectations for. And sin and everything else playing into that, I, it just left me broken. And I believe God used this brokenness um, for me to recognize something that I had not really recognized um, before that point. I remember after I was dealing with this, I was just lying in bed one day in Georgia and things were getting kind of shaky in Georgia as well. So I was it's already made up my mind to move back to New York. And this situation truly propelled me to want to really go back to New York. And I was lying in bed and I was just crying and I was just in the dark, I was crying. Um, and I remember reaching my, my arms up to the ceiling and I remember just weeping that sob that just like is pulled from your soul like that, that sob that, that is silent and it's just like I was trying to hold back the sob. I didn't want anybody to hear me. I was just crying. It was just terrible. And I reached my arm up and I just, I, I didn't know what I was doing, but I remember saying, God, help me help me. I remember the pain was so deep and it wasn't even that serious. But at that point, I think everything was just kind of like just falling in on me. Like I was just feeling like, why doesn't anything ever work? I'm always moving from here to there. You know, I've always been house to house to house my whole life. You know, things were always shaky with my mom. I was always living with relatives. Um, and I would always go back to my mom and it would just be back and forth, back and forth. And I was just like, why is this always happening to me? Why can't I ever have any peace? Why does everything I set my face to do just never work out the way it's planned? And I reached my arm up and I cried and I didn't realize I was crying out to God, but the words left my, my mouth and I said, God, help me. And I wound up moving back to New York shortly after that. And when I got to New York, there was a, a guy that I knew since I was 13. And, and me and him just right away got into this romance thing and um, we dated for two years and half like in the middle of our relationship I began to have dreams I began to have dreams that I never ever had before that I never experienced before dreams that would have me waking up completely afraid I was crying I was like the people that would like when I would wake up next to him he wouldn't know what to say to me. Like, I'd just be 
you know, replaying this dream and just describing it to him. And he'd be sitting there wide eyed like, whoa. And then when I was living with my aunt, you know, I would tell my cousin whom I, you know, I slept in the same room with and she would be like, wow. And at this point, I didn't realize until the dreams got super specific. I didn't realize that God was dealing with me through my dreams. One of the first dreams that I had that really scared me, um, and I'm going to go and try to just paraphrase really quick and just do it really fast. I had a dream that I was in a car and the car was going down this straight street. And on both sides of the street were buildings just lined up on both sides. And I was just going down this very straight road. And I remember um, the car... The the car was so specific. The details of the car were so sp specific. I remembered it. it the, the doors of the car were made of alcohol bottles, right? I remember being in this car. I remember the light was really dim in the car. And I remember I was there with other people. Um, and I remember just kind of swaying as if there were music on. I don't remember hearing music, but I was swaying as if there were music on. I remember there must have been what I thought to be a disco ball, but I didn't see the disco ball. All I saw was lights flashing on everybody's faces, just all these colorful lights. We were swaying. The doors were made out of alcohol bottles. This, to me now, it was a party scene that God was showing me. Like, this was the party scene, and I was going down this road in this car. I remember, I don't know what caught my attention, what made me look to the side, but I looked to the side, and I looked out the window, and it was a very dark night. I remember looking out the window and being completely amazed at what I was seeing, I saw above each building on both sides of the streets were clouds shaped into two hands. And each building had its own set of hands. And this, the hands were right up at the top of the buildings and they clapped very slowly. And you could just see the buildings with the hands above each and every one clapping very slowly. And as they clapped, lights shot up out of the windows of the buildings right up into the hands. And I remember like looking, like tapping whoever I was with. I'm like, yo, do y'all see this look? And I remember the people that were with me, they would look and then they would just kind of look at me and then they would just go back to dancing. And I was amazed. I was just staring astonished at this sight. And I would be like, yo, y'all kidding me? Like y'all don't see this? And they would look again and they would just look at me and they would go back to dance. It's as if they could not see what I was seeing, right? And now, you know how dreams, dreams just kind of, you know, shift. And so I was in one of the buildings and I remember looking out the fire escape. And I remember as I looked at the fire escape, I saw these, these glimpses of light moving so fast, just in and out of the buildings around. They were just like the speed of light. They were just moving in and out of the buildings and around them. Um, and I remember... You know, in dreams that you you just have this knowing, like you don't know why you know, but you know what's going on. And in my dream, I knew that those lights were angels and I knew that they would, they were coming back for God's people. I don't know if you've ever heard of the term rapture, but rapture is when Jesus Christ comes back for his church to remove them off the earth. Um, and the wicked get left behind. So I was, I screamed up to one of the angels. I said, don't leave me behind. And it was one of the lights that was about to pass over to the next building because I was looking at the fire escape and it stopped before it went over. And I, it like recognized me and it just zoomed and went straight down into my chest. Like it just came right inside of me. And then it boom, zoomed right back out and went with the other angels and they just... And in that moment, I knew that the angel searched me and something about me wasn't right. It couldn't take me back and it just... It couldn't take me with it and just left. And I heard a knock at the door and I opened the door and on the floor on a piece of paper said how to succeed in Christ. And I woke up. Imagine having this dream. Now I told you when I was living in Georgia a few, you know, a few weeks before I went to New York, God was already dealing with me. I had cried out to God that night. And I felt like God answered my cry in that certain things I would do before that I was that I would do in that moment. And it wouldn't be like easy for me to do it. Like, I, like that's when conviction, like when God deals with a person, he starts to convict them. He starts to restore their conscience. Things that you have done over and over that sear your conscience. It's like you have no feelings towards it. You don't recognize it as wrong anymore. It's like he restores that conscience back. Like your conscience is God given that thing that says, don't do this. Don't do that. That's wrong. That's right. That conscience is God-given. Even unbelievers who don't believe in God, they have a God-given conscience. Even they know what's right and what's wrong. So I had seared my conscience. At that point, I was smoking weed. Um, 
most of you might not agree that that's a sin, but we can go into that in another video and why, you know, I truly, this is my conviction. Um, I was smoking weed. I was dating women. I was having sex with women, even in the house that my cousin invited me into with children there. Yes, I was like, my conscience was seared. I was stealing. I was shoplifting. Um, I had a long history of stealing before that from people. But this time, it was like I would only shoplift. I, I stopped stealing from people at that point. Um, um, you know, fornication, which is premarital sex. On, on top of that, sexual for, um, fornication with women. You know, shoplifted from stores. Just, I, I, I was completely done. Um, and so when I would do the whole shoplifting thing, cause I would, I would go to Macy's and I would just take whatever I wanted, wear it out under my clothes and come out and I would just have, and I would brag about it. Like, you know, I was able to take this and I'm just so good at it. I never got caught, never got caught. And it wasn't that I was good at it. God spared me. God is like, he just put a veil over those people's faces. They had to know I was, they, I was a regular there. But anyway, um. And so I remember this one particular time when I would watch a video, somebody tagged me in this video and it was a poem and it was a poem about us running from God and God constantly chasing us and us feeling unworthy to be able to even be a Christian and things like that. And so that video, I remember watching it and I was showing it to my cousin and I was just weeping and crying. It's like for the first time, God's word was penetrating me. I, he was dealing with me. My heart was, was, he was, he was touching my heart. He had his hand upon me. He was, he was grooming me and I was starting to understand how much I needed God, how sinful my nature was, how terrible my actions were and how I had to make better decisions. And this conviction followed me for a long time. So when I moved to New York and I was in this relationship and two, um, a year into the relationship, God gave me dreams and he started to deal with me and I started Started to it changed everything it completely changed everything for me and it even affected my relationship on a grand scale um so you know I had that dream so you can imagine what that like I, I had that dream and I just woke up like oh my god and um there was so many more dreams but the dream started to get very scary I started having dreams of fire hitting the earth I had dreams of tsunamis tsunamis sweeping over the earth and destroying everything I had dreams that the that the ground opened up and land and houses and cars were falling into the ground. I had dreams of a blood moon and what's crazy is I had dreams. I had four dreams of the Statue of Liberty. I had a dream that the Statue of Liberty crumbled. I had a dream that it fell straight on its face. I had a dream that the torch was being cut off and I had a dream that the, there was water up to its neck. Like, and I was on this boat and it was water up to the Statue of Liberty's neck. Um, and I, and I know without a shadow of a doubt that God is talking about judgment on America. The Bible and the, and here's another one. I had a dream about my little cousin, Joel, my, my, my female cousin, Patricia, she has a son and his name is Joel and he's a baby. And I had a dream that he was running and I was trying to chase after him. And I woke up and I never knew what this about it. I think I even hit up my cousin like, Hey, watch Joel with streets. I was just dreaming that he ran across the street. It had nothing to do with that. We got to pay attention to what God is showing us. And we got to really seek God through prayer. God, what are you trying to say to me? I didn't pray about this, but God showed me the interpretation of the dream. Um, or what he, why he showed me Joel. I remember one day, this was after I was taking God seriously. I was really getting scared. I was praying like, God, help me. What are you trying to say to me? How do I get right with you? What do I do? How do I confess my sin? How do I repent? Like, this was my speech with God. This was my heart with God. And I remember... Um, when I had that dream, it was like God was showing me exactly what he was trying to tell me through my previous dreams of destruction and a Statue of Liberty and everything. I remember sitting on my, my mother's porch, her terrace um, in Far Rockaway. I was overlooking the beach. It was early in the morning. I had my Bible on my lap. I was having a cup of coffee. And I was one of those people that was kind of like, all right, I don't know what I'm going to read today. You know, there's so many books in the Bible. I don't know what I should read. So I was just that, that type of person that just opened up like wherever I opened it, that's where I was going to start reading. I opened it up and the book of Joel is like four chapters. So it was like two pages in the Bible. I opened it right up to the book of Joel. And as soon as I saw the word Joel, I said, my God, Lord, you were telling me to read the book of Joel. What's the book of Joel about? The book of Joel is about destruction hitting a nation. It's about um, God's judgment on a nation. If you read some parts of Isaiah, the book of Jeremiah, there's so much destruction on this end times nation. There's a nation, um, there's a prophecy in the Bible that talks about this great nation being brought down 
um, to the dust. Um, God is going to judge this nation because their sins are as Sodom and Gomorrah. Their sins are so great. Um, and he has given them space to repent. He has sent his messengers. He, he has given the word to the prophets. And the prophets have spoken the word of God about repenting and turning away from your sin. That God would restore you. That God would have mercy upon you. And I read this book. And in the book, God is telling us, you know, turn to me. You know, and I will have mercy upon you. He basically talks about taking the, 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 um, the corn and the grain and the wine, which is basically saying your comforts, your food, the crops are going to wither. You know, there's going to be great destruction. I'm going to show you who God is. You know, I've had mercy on you. I've allowed it to rain on the wicked and on the good. And so that was what was happening um, with that dream. And so when I had all these dreams of destruction, it really hit me. It really scared me. Um, and then I remember after those dreams, everything began to change for me. I remember I was, I was in a relationship with a man, but I, it's not like I had repented for my dealings with women. I was still looking at women. You know, I was working at Sephora doing makeup and uh, there was a girl at Sephora who I was flirting with all the time. Um, and so that, 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 um, that seed was still within me and I wasn't recognizing that this was um ab an abomination to God as of yet and if you guys don't agree with that we can also talk about that on more depth but this is my testimony um this is a video just about my testimony I, I it'd be a 30 40 minute video if I just went into detail about everything but um I remember after those dreams I remember being always in a state of like depression I would always feel just disgusted with myself because it was like God for the first time gave me a lens to see myself the way that he saw me. Not that God saw me as disgusting, but he allowed me to see my sin the way that he saw my sin through the lens of a holy God. Um, we can always justify ourselves. We can always say, listen, I'm not killing anybody. We can always say, listen, God knows my heart. We can always say this. We can always say that. We always can find a way to smooth things over so that we don't have to face our sin. But the truth is, this life is a life that we are given as a gift. And this life is for the purpose of getting to know God and being reconciled with God. Our sin separates us from God, but God reconciled us through the death of his son. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. The Bible says not that we should continue in sin, you know, so... With Jesus Christ taking upon every sin that will ever be committed on himself, dying, he took the place of us. Sin deserves death. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. So our sin definitely deserves death. It deserves judgment. Um, but Christ wore our sins so that we wouldn't have to face the penalty for sin. And when he died... He buried sin where it belonged. And then he was resurrected from the dead on the third day. So when we accept Christ into our life and we get baptized, baptism is a very important part. It's not just a symbol, but when you're baptized, you are dying with Christ and rising up a new creature with Christ. Everything changes. So um, I was able to see my sin for the first time as God had seen my sin. And it depressed me. It made me feel like the word. I remember at that point, the gentleman that I was dating, um, he would always try to restore me and encourage me like, you know, Melissa, like, why are you so hard on yourself? You're not, you know, like you, I basically was, you know, trying to, he didn't know what I knew. He didn't know that I was in Macy's stealing, you know, when I was working at Sephora, he didn't know that most of the stuff that I wore, the Calvin Klein and stuff that I wore was stolen. He didn't know that, you know, he didn't have the convictions I was having about sexual sin and I, we were fornicating and he, he didn't feel the weight and the conviction because God was dealing with me at that point. You know, he knew that I was smoking weed, but I think he just thought it was morally wrong. He didn't realize that it was biblically just not something that God was pleased with. So I had all this conviction in my life and it was just so much. I was masturbating to the point where I would be masturbating in my sleep. I would wake myself up masturbating and that's a demonic thing. That's that's when, when demons come into the story, but we can talk about that in another video. Um, I had lived such a life separated from God 
catering to myself, to my flesh, to my sin. And it was all being revealed to me. God had took the scales off my eyes. He took the veil off my face. And I was able to see this and it depressed me. I was feeling like, ugh, what? And, and, and where do I start and where do I go from here? So when I had these dreams, I began, I, I remember this one time I woke up from one of the worst dreams I ever had. It was a really crazy dream and I saw so many people die. Um, and I got on my knees and I said, God, you know, like, Lord, I don't know. But like, what are you showing me? Like, what do I do? Lord, you know, help me change me. If And then I remember specifically talking about homosexuality. I feel like he was dealing with me. And it was a dream that I had that I saw a rainbow and I saw a train that passed right by me. I knew that train was headed for eternal life and it passed by me. And I remember seeing a rainbow. I knew that God was telling me that this is why I'm leaving you um, because you're choosing these things over me. Um, and so I remember saying, God, if you want me to change, you're going to have to take this from me. You know, I don't know what to do. Just if you, if you want me to change, take this from me. And it was also a point where my aunt, um, my aunt was, was God was using my aunt to really, um, speak to me about homosexuality. This is before I even moved to Georgia. So it seems as though God was dealing with me before 2014, but it was happening in stages. And I think it would have happened a lot faster if I was actually listening to God's voice. Cause I was pushing him out a lot of the time, but God, thank you. His mercy is amazing. It's just beyond what we can imagine. He got, God loves us and he desires that no one would perish, but that we would all come to the truth found only in his son and it's, it's more than just believing and professing because he says in the word that my people you know he didn't say my people he said people profess me with their lips but their hearts are far from me so god is telling us that there is more to this life with him to this walk with him to him being your savior than just acknowledging it because satan acknowledges it satan knows that he's the savior of the world and satan is not going to heaven satan is you know, the Bible says that he's um, already judged. He's reserved for chains of everlasting darkness and for the fire that is never quenched. So, um, yeah, when I was when I was um, when I was around my aunt, she would tell me, you know, Melissa, you know, your lifestyle. God loves you, but, you know, this is not his will for you. And um, I remember after those dreams, after I poured my heart out to God, the dreams got more intense and then I remember having a dream I had repented I had um and by repenting I mean that I I confessed my sin I asked him to help me change and God began to work on me he began to 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 deal with me as I started to read his word after that I got into the bible I started to read the bible and it was amazing me that that the things that I was dreaming was definitely in the book of Revelations. It was in the book of Jeremiah. It was in the book of Joel. And then it made sense to me when he said, in the last days, I'll pour my spirit out on all flesh. Your young women will prophesy. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. When I would tell the people these dreams, the same things I was seeing in the Bible, and I was dreaming about this, I was prophesying. Um, and I was basically, a prophecy is to say what's going to happen. It's telling something is going to happen before it actually happens. So the Bible is full of prophecies and a lot of them, most of them has been fulfilled. And we are in the last days, guys. I want to tell you firmly that we're in the last days. Christ is at the door. He's no longer coming. He's at the door. These years that we're living right now, this is his grace, but it's going to end. God right now is pulling people in. He's waking people up. He's opening eyes. He's, he's setting people free from, he's, you know, dealing with people's hearts. He's telling us to come in now. So um, I remember it, I got into his word. And as I got into his word, I realized that um, there, was, there was a lot of things I had to consider now that I decided to give my life to Christ. I had to, I had to, I realized, and God spoke to me through his word about picking up my cross and following him. Picking up your cross means to carry your cross as Christ carried it. Carry, it, it, it means, how do I explain it? It means to walk with him and you're going to face and you're going to have to endure. You're going to face things. You're going to have to endure things for his sake. So you're going to face sin. You're going to have to fight it tooth and nail. That's what it means to pick up your cross, to walk with Christ. And that means that whatever comes with that life, count it all joy, which means, you know, Sin is going to come into your life. You're going to have to fight it. People are going to, you're going to be separated from people that you thought was like right there with you. You was just good money with them. It, it means that 
you're going to have to count these losses as a gain to draw closer to God. He's going to separate you from people who, who you no longer have things in common with. When you're an addict and you're doing drugs, you got to separate yourself from people, persons, uh, people, places, and things. You can't hang around, um, drug addicts anymore. You know, they're just, you know, it's, you're not going to be able to be any good for each other. You can't hang around, um, places where you did drugs and you can't hang around and you can't, you know, we have those drugs with you, people, people, places and things. Um, and so I began to, God began to deal with me on my sin. He dealt with me on, on homosexuality. So I didn't wake up straight, but God began to take that desire from my heart as I began to separate myself from things like the people I was, you know, dealing with, you know, um, Everything concerning that lifestyle, I had to shut it off, right? Um, stealing, I had to completely, that was not a process. That You can't tell me, oh, you know, some things are a pro No, stealing, I had to stop doing right away. There was there was no going back and stealing a little bit. And a little, no, that, I stopped stealing. Um, smoking weed was a hard one. I had been smoking weed since I was 16, so smoking weed was definitely a hard one. But God took that from me. Thank you, Jesus. Um, and it, I just I stopped smoking weed. I want to say last early last year. So it was a long. It was maybe like I want to say June of last year, and I've been safe for two years. So, um. So he began to deal with me on his, through his word. That's why reading the Bible is so important. If you call yourself a Christian, because a lot of America calls themselves Christians, but by the, the things that we do in America, the things we promote in America, it's clear that we're not Christians. And what is a Christian? A Christian, the word Christian came from um, back in the times where they walked with Christ. If you were a Christian, they were basically calling you a little Christ, a mini Christ. Like you, you looked like Christ, you walked like Christ, but really the name, the term was disciple. If I am a, this one man made a great uh, illustration. If I'm a baker, um, if, if, if I'm studying, there's a master baker. I'm his disciple. He's teaching me the way. He's teaching me the ropes. I'm watching him do it. I'm watching it. And he's teaching me as I do it. And, and you're his disciple. You, and in the end, you're going to look like him. You're going to be really just as good as him, if not right below it. Right. So we're disciples of Jesus Christ. What he does, we do. What he taught, we teach. What what he taught, we actually do. Right. So um, it wasn't until I want to say 2016. I had been over a year with this gentleman I was dating and um there was really, he wasn't facing the same convictions that I was facing. He didn't see the need for um, giving his life or submitting his life to Jesus Christ. So with me changing radically, with me not wanting to have premarital sex, he was actually fine with that, actually. To be honest with you, he was fine with that. But there were other things. Um, as far as like, I didn't want to listen to the same music anymore. I realized God truly revealed to me how music was truly a, a tactic and a tool of the enemy to fill your mind with different things and create strongholds in your mind. You wonder why you're having lustful thoughts when you listen to certain music. You wonder why you're having anger when you listen to certain music. You're wondering why you want to smoke when you listen to certain music. It just, Satan was the, the, the leader in in heaven of like the music thing like he led the other angels in worship and music and and so this it's no surprise that this is definitely one of his instruments on the earth and so i didn't want to be around certain music i didn't want to hear certain music and so he's big on music and i was like it got to the point where it seemed as though i was trying to change him i was always drilling this in his head when god dealt with me and told me i'm coming soon and this is like this is no joke get right with me you, the, you naturally you want everyone around you to know this you want everyone around you to get right with god it's like whoa like this is real okay you need to you know give your life to christ you know you need to really take him seriously it separated us and i remember god spoke to me and told me that this was not his will for me for me to be um unequally yoked fast forward um, we broke up he was fine with it i was had to deal with it and you know um, a few months later, I met this 
man who I'm now married to, and this man is on fire for God. And, um, it just goes to show that you got to be obedient to what the, what God is telling you, what he's trying to do in your life. It don't feel good at first. You know, I was broken over this. I knew this dude since I was 13. I was truly broken over it. It don't feel good. But when you trust God and you allow him to separate you from different people and different things in different places, you have to remember that he has a sight beyond what you can see. He has a will that you can't imagine, that you can't even fathom. And um, it, it, he's working everything together for your good, right? And he knows what's best. He's our Abba Father. He knows beginning to end. Um, and so my testimony I'm sharing, this is like just kind of, I tried to paraphrase everything and it's 30 minutes in. So if you made it to the end of this video, thank you so much. And maybe God is speaking to your heart concerning some things. And um, I don't know why anyone will watch a 30 minute video and, and not be truly like listening to what God is saying. So... Um, I truly thank you for tuning in and I pray um, in Jesus name that whatever he is dealing with your heart on anyone watching that you would just take that leap of faith and trust him that you would recognize that he is so worthy of you putting down the things that your heart is being convicted about taking that leap of faith even when it doesn't feel right he's so worthy of it he loves you beyond what you can imagine and he wants nothing but the best for you he's calling you out because you're his bride he's chasing you because you're his beloved and he wants to put you in position for his call the calling is church. He's coming and he's going to take back those who love him and who are those who are waiting for him. So I just thank you for, you know, making it to the end of this video. And I love you and thank you for listening. And I pray that maybe something I said maybe testified or witness to you. And um, until next time.